Hello everyone, today we look at some particular political, cultural and artistical aspects of old French narrative during the peak of the Chanson de Geste, fundamentally, so the song of deeds, uh, that is the 12th century, right, the, essentially the third quarter especially of the 12th century where uh, lots of broader chivalric ideals uh, are codified right together with the compaction of the so-called feudal monarchies and thus if you want the same peak of feudalism you know an important crossroad between of course tradition and modernity that this literature exemplifies uh, according to patterns that may have been say appreciated appreciated in reverse chronologically speaking that is to say we will know and have heard hopefully uh, I, I really want to hope of the Chanson de Geste per se. Um, and we, uh, aside from all the medievalism coming, you know, in, in more recent centuries, etc., we have always somehow attributed to it a kind of hardcore um, ideological, in fact, artistical, cultural, uh, expressional uh, value and capacity of the, the aforementioned feudal Europe, right? So it's as if, you know, that was the eye of the storm. The Chanson de Geste uh, was just the, the peak of a certain worldview. And essentially what we think of the uh, chivalric uh, Middle Ages uh, stems from there. Uh, as you know, uh, I like to appreciate history in a diachronic and comparative way. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, this the latter interpretation is, of course, modern. And not all modernity is bad, because we just call it in, in a way that uh, can be just the revival of broader universal ideals that do belong to tradition. What is important, however, is, in fact, to appreciate this and fundamentally uh, tearing down barriers, also as far as properly the tradition is concerned. That is to say, uh, yes, we can find many political, military, and social reasons why the Chanson de Geste came about, right? Um, we, uh, we we could extend even to other literature, like for example, Occitan, uh, but al also even the same old French lyric uh, is, is very important as well. Uh, the, say France, um, the Western Frankish Kingdom still at this point, and other areas were more affected like England, and that's the, the hardcore were these. Um, in fact, literary models spread from, as you know, together with Gothic architecture at the same time, all this stuff can be explained, right, in a kind of uh, political, social sense, uh, there was the lock of uh, knighthood at this point that became something more strictly associated with nobility in fact in, in a social sense uh, not even necessarily in a political one because the monarchy is also taking over um, and of course other countries in Europe were undergoing similar changes but either to a different degree and or a, a different point um, of the of the path and just with of course always some uh, distinct, uh, the distinct character of, of their own, the way uh, the old French narrative is received in Germany or is rece uh, received in, in Italy is is slightly different. It it, it uh, works through different mechanisms, right? So um, that is something we will be looking at, uh, especially that there was an important commonality, uh, as you understand. Uh, this literature was uh, just the in fact, the, the, the reflection of uh, a broader civilizational dynamic that you can start drawing since the time of the Merovingians by, by a degree. Uh, but there is also something much more ancestral connected with it that, in, in my opinion, is not appreciated uh, per se. That is, you know, we will never know who, let's say, who, in fact, uh, a late 12th century knight slash um, singer. Um, in fact, composer, because this is also one of the very interesting aspects, as you know, that you find even in the Minnesanger, in other um, 
in other uh, authors of the time that they were knights themselves, right? So there is something very interesting about, of course, as we know, also biologically, anthropologically, the peak of male violence as the peak of male creativity. Um, and uh, when you realize that um, such incredibly sensitive and incredibly poetic and, and artistic minds were also capable, right, physically to butcher people to pieces on a regular basis, well, that, that really opens to you uh, like a, a wholly different world um, that must be understood as such. And naturally, the uh, Chanson de Geste was, as we'll see now, also entailing a bit of the, the conflictuality existing between a broader order, authority such as the royal one, and the uh, concept of more uh, shared nobility on the base, properly of arm bearing. Uh, and such uh, things, but of course the world was going towards uh, modernization and secularization um, and I, we made videos about uh, the history of French cavalry and chivalry and we have seen how of course knighthood changed uh, from centuries to centuries we want to approximate uh, it like that but it's also part of a broader flow that you can't quite categorize just per se, and that you should be way more attentive in assessing for the broader dynamic that it is that you normally don't see pictured. Um, we will look at these traditional aspects now, but we'll, so um, some other preliminary information of the roughly 100 chansons de geste composed from the 11th through, um, say, to the end of, of the 14th century. The major poems notoriously date from the 12th century, and especially this uh, third, fourth, um, which tells you, of course, how the genre was uh, already present, um, you know, since some time in which still knighthood was a bit more loose in terms of political restrictions and um, let's say more socially spread by a degree but also how much still the uh, the contracting um, great medieval civilization in, in, in the 14th century was still looking at those values as so in the grading part of their uh, of their essence, right, even of their lifestyle by a degree. Um, the most famous chanson de geste, um, so the song of deeds, as, as you know, in the Langue uh, de Ile, and perhaps um, the earliest accent, by the way, exemplar, uh, is the chanson de Roland, mm -hmm. which, you know, is pretty obvious. Um, still today, s you know, in, in many regions of Europe, there is probably still a folklore, right, that we uh, preserved about this uh, this figure, this paladin, and uh, and all the meaning attached. Um, despite its early date, the Chanson de Roland exhibits the complex structure and competence of a genre that existed more than a short while, right? Like most of the other chansons, um, it is essentially an assonating the casillabic verses um, grouped in strophes uh, of varying length, known as less, right? And this structure already tells you how comprehensive it was and how also literally advanced, right? The, the less, uh, per se, are arranged to uh, exalt each other. Right, uh, there through the use of amplification, repetition, parallelism, antithesis, antithesis, and this, anthropologically speaking, reflects um, first of all the uh, the effervescent nature and composition still at the time of like could be a political and military spectrum, right? Mostly still the idea that you had to create an order, yet that there is an order made by the interaction of all the elements that must be individually um, noticed for what they are. So this is an important pattern in the affirmation of a greater collective 
discipline, for example, and the knightly individualism that was happening definitely at that time. So the Chanson de Roland, as we will see now, does have a hierarchy because the, the Paladine is the, um, uh, the, the, in fact, the protagonist of, of, of the story, but there were lots of other characters around that are essentially finding their own way in the world as warriors and um, f fundamentally make a, a corolla of, all, uh, of the broader story that is also quite famous. So by and large, uh, the chanson um, take uh, took at the time as their themes explore of war that um, relate to an earlier Frankish history, right, and particularly the Carolingian period. And this is not surprising, of course, because that was the the heyday, the moment of greatest glory of the Frankish tradition, as we were noticing before. At this point, actually, in the late 12th century, the, what we call the Kingdom of France, the Royaume de France, was actually still the Western Frankish Kingdom, the Kingdom of the Western Franks, right? It was, of course, a huge imperial grandeur uh, as a broader cultural legacy of the Carolingian Empire that was mostly, uh, in fact, based in the centers of power, even though the Carolingians were Austrasians of origin, in fact, in a, in a Romance, world, or essentially today's northern France, um, parts of Belgium, most. That was properly the hardcore of the French market, and that's also a bit the mm, you know, political territorial nucleus from which the same Neustrian Frankish kingdom gave origin to the, um, to the, in fact, what we call the court, the kingdom of France, the same, the same place where this literature was being produced as part of the Langue de Ville and uh, as uh, an important political entity that doesn't matter how, in fact, feudal in nature, but was pretty much glued together. Um, and what this military warlike and properly imperialistic mindset had survived to an extent that was unknown even to the uh, German Empire at this very time, that, as you know, was essentially at its peak as the greatest power in Western Europe. Um, so these songs, uh, of course, emerge from uh, an obscure background, as we will see now, so as far as the, the philology of the Chanson de Roland is concerned, because it literally pops out from the, um, from the 8th century to the, to the 12th, right? So, again, without any other literary link, right? So it's obvious that it was a, a massive, oral tradition going on that superseded the literary one, I believe, uh, at least uh, as a broader mass of knowledge that was simply passed down the generation. So um, this was naturally part of the same nightly background culture training. I mean, memorizing was just something that everybody was more habituated to uh, at the time than, than we are today. Right, there were people who knew the Bible by heart. Right, and you can't easily do it. Like literally, it's not even about that story of using one percent of the brain um, only. It's literally that even still by using that few, as we do normally, could easily learn things by heart in that scale. Right, um, and if you had a bit of practice of that even in school, you you kind of have an idea of how you can easily develop a kid's mind right, in, in that direction. Well, consider that given that knights also were almost all illiterate, uh, so at this point, the, um, uh, the, the, and this naturally makes more valuable also their uh, songs, production, where it was written down, but that there was just a, another, um, sort of a, a massive circulation, right, a whirlwind of these stories, these legions, everybody had their own version, interestingly enough. So this was a way, uh, in fact, to, uh, like they turned it into, like a, a literal literary tournament, right? Um, everybody showed off uh, in that uh, way, as if they just, they, they would have done militarily in, in a tournament or in battle. And consider that at this time, actually, there wasn't even much of a difference between a tournament and a battle. They were literally the same thing, right? Um, 
and I'm not, that included in everything because uh, what we know stereotypically of medieval tournament in popular culture is just a, a very late medieval if not properly early modern tournament in the 12th century we're talking about a completely different thing or almost uh, completely so um, so um, the um, baggage the cultural legacy right from Carolingian times um, is eventually connected with stories that dated back to then right doesn't matter how elaborated they were we will see now that of course there were some limits and um, adjustments and you know made up stories and you can trace that back up to the classical tradition and most of this chanson glorify well at, at least some so let's make a picture of it the lineage of a particular noble family which was the big deal this time because exactly in the moment in which as we were saying before the chansons were mostly produced it was the problem was securing the nobiliar and knightly status as a clan right within a so a above the others uh, within the political institutional structure of feudal monarchies um, this type of story uh, is mostly revolving around uh, noblemen fighting internal or external enemies, right? Uh, on behalf of, however, an incompetent and ungrateful king. This note is interesting because it shows, first of all, the aforementioned conflict between the monarchy and the knights, um, but still essentially an acceptation, right? That corresponds to the affirmation of the feudal monarchies at this point and also highlights the um, sacrificial, uh, selfless, um, heroic nature of these knights uh, that have essentially to be, uh, first of all, always uh, at the same level, at least of the king, because that was in terms of moral values, right, not being ever less. Um, but that sometimes, um, of course, aim at going also beyond, so a way of criticizing the system but without tearing it apart because they were the same ones com struggling right, to, and benefiting from the, their same affirmation in the system was to say, well, that specific king was bad, let's say, and so this knight was cool um, and he did what he had to do and things happened, which is, are not even necessarily positive, right, because the um, let's say, if we would like to see an, from a Judaic perspective the, the parable of, of the suffering uh, just, right? And uh, the, the idea that uh, actually you cannot achieve, accomplish anything if you don't suffer, if you don't sacrifice yourself, literally, um, is proper of all the traditional background, right? It's just like even uh, part of the early, you think about the Germanic epos, like the idea that the hero always dies, and not just dies um, in a good way, like he, he dies actually in a pretty mm, bad one, right, in a in a dishonorable one, if you want, so something like, you know, being mm, stabbed uh, at his back, um, and always for a fault, always for something that he did at the beginning, that he got wrong, and so that somehow polluted the entire purity of the thing. It's just like the gold of the Asgard, right? The fact that eventually the same gods will pay for uh, their, you know, this this having become slightly less of what they were. And this is the entire, in fact, universal tradition about mankind as a world that could achieve divinity by just being perfect. Instead, wanted to choose. Um, uh, the, the possibility of good and evil, right? The possibility of being mortal, because it, it's as if, you know, absolute pop power uh, was too too much all of the sudden. It's a, and that's an interesting metaphor, of course, but it's really at the root of this entire thing. Um, other chansons um, show also two noble families locked in conflict with each other, or one rebel nobleman defending himself against a king. So the, the struggle with the king too, but uh, considering that, especially from a knightly point of view, the king was a sort of primus inter pares, still, 
uh, and considered that it was just a few time before that the same Western Frankish king that were the most dynastic in Europe were uh, actually just passing down the title without just it was a formal election but in theory it was all the the armed freemen just like in the in the thing that had to be uh, had to elect this ruler because of his fitness right um the um knights uh, represented uh, as such still a potential uh, yet another power like the king was just one of them right the top one but and that could be also bad as we've seen but also there were lots of other families and we have seen of course how um, even in some feudal feuds that we will have to discuss we made something about Germany something about Italy we have to see France perhaps in one of those territorial examples but there are m really many what you um, and there are those countries are easier because they were more politically fragmented so uh, in France you always see that there is a sort of uh, dominate, especially at this point, by the king. Um, in um, in high medieval times, you know, again, mostly after the Capetians managed to affirm themselves as uh, just born and sovereigns of the de France. Uh, this incredibly brutal and vicious and um, properly co self-consuming feud. I don't know if you have ever had any relative, you know, that quarreled over, you know, the, the inheritance, the success, things like that. You know, families can really hate each other. To consider that these noblemen were very often all married into each other in one way or another. So there was a conflict that went that across the whole spectrum of the political, military, and social um, uh, system because they were the same people they all knew each other um they were aware of of, of this clanetary uh, hierarchy of how it intersected how it overlapped and so it's obvious that uh, in this nightly um again whirlwind you you would always given what was at stake very often not just in terms of war but even just again a patrimony success inheritance things like that uh, it's quite interesting um, sex sexual tension is also very important because um, a big deal for uh, a courageous nobleman who had or just say nobleman say knight uh, in a relatively unspecified way also before um, the period of peak of the chanson um, could simply make a fortune by marrying notoriously a rich widow right that's something that um, can say happens necessarily still today but you find in literature even in modern contemporary time by the side you know, of musketeers of other uh, hairs of, of the knights uh, in that way so there was a ferocious competition over the woman over um, over power per se right and th this this aspect is also kind of more interesting as the same chanson de Rouen shows because he basically doesn't even give a damn about his his um, uh, woman who loved him, but you know while he's dying she's crying because she kind of feels that um, female instinct. But he, what he actually thinks while he's dying is about living alone, his sword, right, and crying over her, and and that that that's also very traditional actually in nature for many reasons that today we cannot even technically digress on. Because um, the the symbol of the woman, also in the chivalric, uh, the courtly romance, is very often, uh, first of all, a highly idealized one, but it, it literally represents this um, forces of the darkness that need to be tamed to eventually transform her into her, say, vi into victory, into essentially your own soul, into the one that can win heaven. Right, these were the same people who were literally uh, living for the Crusades, and there is a huge symbolism attached to this. That some female characters of the stories are beautifully incarnating, by the way, and also with the in the classical past, because again, the classical past was actually deeply imbued with the same uh, chivalric, proto chivalric, if you prefer, ideas. And m my, I, I mean, to me, it's 
certain at least that, that these knights may have been dramatically ignorant in classical literature, but whenever they read the stories per se, they immediately understood the meaning of the Aeneid of, we'll see it now, because these people were obsessed with Alexander, with the Romans, uh, and, and beyond, right? So uh, they were able to grasp some meanings. They're not just, uh, you know, uh, as we will see now, clumsy literary um, pastiche, right? As it may seem from a strictly philological point of view, because they literally were able to identify the archetypes within that to a point that we probably even don't, right, it, unless we, we are aware of it. Um, and it's obvious that um, an important place in among these topics of the chanson were the celebration of Christian victories, right, especially the Carolingian ones, again, because Charlemagne had already said essentially this idea of crusade, where fighting over the infidels. We made videos about Charlemagne and stress how, of course, the uh, the Frankish protection over the church, the Renovatio Imperi, was importantly founded on the Carolingian fight against pagans, or you know, non-Christians in general, from the Saxons to, to the Muslims. So, um, peoples that essentially were not were wrong about the universal imperial traditional catholic ideology uh, that um, revolved definitely uh, around the same hardcore value of knightly training right all these people were fundamentally uh, obsessed with that transfigurational possibility that just winning heaven through arms is the same exact thing it could have been taught by a bronze age uh, hero right and the only difference perhaps being the church being a medium now between uh, god and, and and the knight but that still had the incredible civilizational capacity of discipline challenging these force and you know uh, renewing the same um, traditional ideology within for example, the Crusade, which is literally the same thing. It is bearing this. As much as, you know, these knights were uh, still believing, but not quite rationalizing just per se. Here, again, the classical legacy must be stressed as a, as a massive uh, element of the fact that great medieval civilization, universal revival, which failed for reasons that actually had to do with the same failure of, of the empire and the papacy historically, but as, as a collective failure of mankind, right? not of some strange reasons that uh, pertain to this or that side per se. Right? Uh, moral standards always project you towards the thought right because they always make you achieve and teach you what is effectively the, the right direction so there is no other way of relativistically put it unless you are in fact you have not accomplished that yet and you know that sadly today is the norm but this this must be stressed uh, necessary uh, the um, as far as the topics of the chanson are concerned of course they all intertwine, right? They interlock um, with each other in in vast narrative cycles. Um, in in the case of the Chanson de Roland, as we were saying before, there was not even properly a, a sound historical basis, right? At, at least um, we know that on August the fifteenth, seven hundred seventy-eight, the Count Roland of Brittany, Frankish count. Britain was killed when the rear guard of Charlemagne's army was attacked by the Basques and some Muslims, because they were present. Um, as um, it crossed the Pyrenees back towards Gaul, and apart from a few terse mentions in, in fact, in the eighth, the ninth century records, the tale of Roland, 
um, from the view, at least of properly the earliest manuscripts that we can uh, recuperate, and so started circulating the, the mass in form with the chanson, uh, is um, the second quarter of the 12th century, with the actually a manuscript from Oxford being transcribed, by the way. So, of course, there was, you know, already some literature strictly meant about that before, right? It didn't, um, you know, they didn't find, find it by chance hidden somewhere. Um, and it's obvious, as we were saying before, that there was a, an oral tradition about that. But what is fascinating is, you know, trying to realize whether that this was kind of just a re augmented for literary artistic purposes, whether it was still properly a tale that has survived among the gossip of the Carolingian Antrustiones, talking about oh my god, that guy fought till the end in the rear guard because he was, you know, just going for that uh, divine transfiguration, man. And then everybody talking about that. Of course, it was plenty of legions like that. I mean, just think about all the wars that were fought in Carolingian times and how few we actually know about what even, even happened. Because simply, it was just ecclesiastical historiography, especially north of the Alps. You literally have some um, abbots that were Carolingian Franks themselves. Um, and, uh, for example, Nithard, right, that describes the Battle of Fontenoy is the bloodiest in Carolingian history and that would die in a skirmish, I think, in, in Aquitaine against the Vikings. You know, this guy literally talks about the battle in his ecclesiastical style, even though he was a warrior himself, and just doesn't say anything. You you need to take, uh, uh, you know, some, some other sources, even from actual priests living in Italy, maybe to have maybe some slightly, you know, more precise information. Um, just think that the only Carolingian battle that we can tactically re reconstruct is the Battle of Zuntal, by the way, one of the few, uh, admittedly, Carolingian defeats as well. For the rest, it's just like we have to imagine how it was technically on the base of some, again, comparative military history, the, the, the panoply, the, some broader considerations we can make. But it's obvious that this, the, fundamentally the same aristocracy from which eventually even the, the one of the 12th century, in, at least in great part, or at least in a, se in a cultural sense, descended, had been talking about these events for... Uh, they weren't even so distant, if you think about it. How, how much was this? Like, uh, just 300, 400 years. Um, so it's obvious that they had remained easily, especially in the highest circles and among people who always made war and so that also revived the memory of these possibilities. Um, history of this or that commander, right? And we just don't know exactly what Roland struck them more than, surely he wasn't, ne say maybe, right? But statistically, how was it just the greatest? of all the Carolingian warriors whose tales were, were told back in the day. Of course not, and of course there is a lot of making up stories, including, again, the fact that he was fighting against the, the Saracens, while he was actually fighting against the Basques, who also sided with the Saracens, so it's never like a f like either black or white, just per se. Um, but of course it's just another story in a canon that was created, uh, or at least um, molded in that way we know in the story later. But the archetype contained there is pretty much universal in a knightly mentality. So when this tale reemerges, uh, it has definitely taken on a new form um, that exalts feudal relations in that case. That's also just a narrative style of some sort. The action centers, in fact, upon the struggle of a vassal on behalf of his lord, um, because there was an explicit order there, right? Um, an explicit responsibility of calling, not calling the king, you know, the old story of the horn. Um, and so, something that we don't see much there, just 
out of a honor, individual honor perspective, but it was also political in nature, right? These men were dramatically competitive and invested in that. That it was a fierce competition at the court to enter in the grace of Charlemagne and all this thing. Um, so Charlem um, Roland passes down this great hero because he self-sacrifices himself. He prefers not to call or to call till the last, breaking the same horn at the end of the day, warning and dying in the process to warn that the, as if the Imperium had passed from him in that valley to eventually Wuhan to know what, what had been happening in that, uh, in that uh, battle in the rear guard. Right. And we have interesting comparative histories about this. For example, I don't know, also in Paul the Diacon, among the longer birds, we find um, heroes connected to, to the rear guard um, in connection with the royal army. The struggle between um, Lutbrand and Ratkis and Heistulf, the Duke of, of Friuli, and his um, and, and his brother would be the future king of the Longbirds is uh, is similar after all, right? And um, in, in that case, they actually won, by the way. Um, so, as you understand here, there is a a, a pattern. Uh, that exalted the idea that, of course, fighting in the rear guard was, first of all, actually a place of honor because it was an incredibly risky position and you had to entrust it just to very good commanders. So everybody was checking them also because there was always a possibility of betrayal. So the loyalty, the honor, right, that's how you have to read Roland per se, ha having had that command post, not just the man himself necessarily. Because probably also these these people didn't know so much about him. It, w it was just a story uh, that they were repeating, right? Um, and um, and of course in in the chanson there is also the need of the lord of Charlemagne, uh, the king, the emperor, to avenge the death of his vassal. Around the central vassal lord relationship, that is fundamental because it's the one that you always find in any feudal reality is to say the vassal wears loyalty, but the lord must protect the vassal then. Because it's as if he had, the vassal had become an extension of the lordly imperium, so it's always the, the commander in chief's fault for anything that happens. This is a, a hardcore traditional. Um, value there. It's it's always uh though death, right, and uh sort of contractual clientary connection. Um are clustered the histories of the other vassals. They all aspire to win honor and thieves from their battles from the for their lord, which definitely fits also pretty well the twelfth century background. Uh, and Deapos is replete with the trappings of feudalism, such as symbolic gauntlets and swords so these are a bit literary embellishments, but they all mean a lot themselves. The sword, again, was the same alter ego of the man. As we've seen, Roland loves his sword more than um, his um, his woman. So th this is, again, yet the, the ascetic concept that laying even beyond the, this is the same century of the uh, the Laude Nove Militia by Bernard of, uh, of, of Clairvaux, uh, the, the monastic military orders. And it has to do even in there with that, you know, initiatic um, passage that makes the knight just not being affected by anything but um, following his faith per se. Uh, so being insensitive, apparently, even to some specific conventions that, however, embody other archetypal, higher meaning. And in fact, what is interesting in this chanson is that um, there is no idealized love. I mean, talking about the ones of, of uh, Roland, specifically, between men and women, right? Um, that instead is very common in the 12th century lyric and in the 12th century romance. There were also differences between the Languedoc and the Languedoc. Uh, the Languedoc and, you know, that Aquitaine, the south of France, was considered a bit like more frivolous, southerner, emotional, sentimental, passionate 
in all these things whereas the, the north was darkly stern um authoritarian cold rigid uh, inflexible right so um there were different styles uh literary styles connected with it and of course a lot of inter intersections for that matter that can be exemplified by the same state building of the Capetians, even marrying a bite that was a, a failure, you know, between Henry the Seventh and Eleanor of, of Aquitaine and such things. Um, whereas the Chanson de Jazz present warriors and warfare on an epic scale, the romances that were created in the second half of the 12th century deal as much as with chivalric ethos as with uh, battle rules as much with women as with men as much as with solitary uh, adventures right as with mass conflict um, and as much as with enchanted outer worlds um, as with the bloody reality of either the supposed here and now or the ostensibly historical past. So, a melange that includes all, right, that naturally reflects that degree of uh, categorization that is typical of you know, modernity, the fact that, of course, these were big systems historically that had never quite appeared, and, and that were fueling that amount of traditional view because they were still emerging essentially from a feudal reality where the individual value was considered enormously and so this was the elite the top um, and they must be um, you know that honorable at the same time it was you know it was still an elite that had to uh, let's say consolidate per se so um, it couldn't be just an aseptic and or simplified version of the story uh, of like an unchallenged power that nobody can touch right the same knights wrote uh, so they weren't the kings per se it's obvious that at that point uh, and this is why some of these stories reemerge and mostly what we call chivalry in in a narrow sense emerges by the late 12th century is that unavoidably this stuff could not uh, reappear but in a literary form because that shift from the oral is also in a sense the detachment from a tradition that was being perceived as distancing itself right you don't sign down you don't write down uh, a note a, a passage we, we see this in codicology in paleography that sometimes even some early vernacular was like little jokes, um, word games, uh, you know, lyrics were just noted next to, in the margin of a manuscript, it was, I don't know, just about um, some ecclesiastical work um, and that had barely anything to do with that because people wanted to remember. This. And so this big tradition, of course, is connected to else, as we've seen, it's political, it, uh, it's social, but it also means that that world of, of stories that still excited these individuals, but that during the lock of, of knighthood uh, were evidently just left being left behind in terms of, for example, continuous lifestyle in arms, etc., because it, um, uh, it would gradually decrease just as even a, as a personal involvement as a more direct involvement this is the gradually the moment in which great uh, commanders are also uh, let's say becoming ever more detached from not necessarily from from the battlefield per se but in greater positions of command rather than actual individual fighting so this this whole mechanism together with lots of others, the professionalization of warfare, the, in fact, the rationalization of resources brings the need also to rationalize oral tradition, literary production about these things. Uh, a lot has to do also with vernacular. It's 
more people want to know, right? More people are literate and they are in search for for knowledge. Uh, the 12th century well, was actually a terrible time in, in many ways, but we rem remember it f mostly as a sort of renaissance, right? And the reason being, uh, indeed, that uh, there were maybe even other groups, other estates that wanted to know about this chivalric tradition. Um, for which these topics are also uh, classified or categorized and ordered within the same chanson. For example, Jean Baudel offered um, a tripartite scheme of French narrative in his Chanson de Saxon, dating to the very end of the 12th century. So the, the Song of the Saxons in this regard, so you understand always Eco in the Carolingian theory, but there is more than just the um, these um, Carolingian references. You have, in fact, the three bodies split like this. First, the matter of France, right? So, the more the most traditional stories of Charlemagne and his peers that in the Western Frankish kingdom had probably been consolidated in a deeper uh, sense, ingrained properly in the local political identity, memory, uh, cultural legacy, and so on. Then the matter of Britain, mm, so this, essentially the Arthurian cycle, um, that is an interesting uh, transmission, essentially from, in fact, a even pre-Anglo-Saxon background, as you understand, from Britain, uh, in a moment in which uh, we just talk about English history exactly in those centuries. Of course, we're seeing French rulers in the country, so we'll see this better as far as also the uh, the usage of the geneal genealogy of the Trojan War was used by the same Normans, but Normans, Angevins, right? So they arrive in England, they find presumably lots of interesting stories uh, saying of the Germanic epos, but they also see that there is Arthurian stuff. They, they knew it already, likely, because the Britons had been next door, the same as Britain, in spite of the channel. But this stuff is also traditional, from the Celtic background, from that actually Romano-Britonic one, the struggle against the Saxons, the, even the Sarpmatian element that had been injected as Roman auxilia, in, uh, in fact, late Imperial Britain, uh, etc. And in fact, the third body has to do with the so-called matter of Rome, right? Uh, and this included actually all the classical Hellenic and Roman myths alike, so histories, stories, and legends that of course, had always mixed, right? And we, we tend to classify also with too much ease. And that were integrated, not just because, of course, uh, during the Middle Ages, the, the classical past was still alive, right? There was still a Roman emperor. There was still, in fact, an imperial power. Uh, the same French kings were, after all, looking... Uh, forward to, to, to achieve it, and they, they would even succeed basically by the 13th century, uh, de facto. So, um, you have this necessity, but also the fact that the authors knew, as we were saying before, pretty well all the archetypal meanings of such stories that are powerfully ancestral and traditional and uh, essentially matching even with part of the the Celto-Germanic epos, because they all came from, from the, the same Indo-European cauldron. So, the matter of Britain encompasses most of the chansons de geste, interestingly enough. Um, even more than, in fact, the, the matter of, of France. And this is particularly fascinating, because it may have actually reflected a more knightly than royal interest uh, due to the fact that in fact the Arthurian cycle is based just you know the legend of the round ta uh, table 
the you know the, the sense of equality of the night and this more archaic background of essentially late, an, late antiquity uh, that it was drawn from as opposed to Carolingian times that were closer and something else in practice toying also with uh, properly the, the Renium, the Imperium and being probably also you know of course better known and more perhaps kings and people and commoners matter than knightly one right so there may be a coloring in that in that regard a favoring of the of the Arturian of Britonic um, uh, knighthood as opposed to the, even the Frankish one and the interesting aspect of the matter of Britain is that uh, it doesn't encompass much that would tell a modern sense of medieval courtly romance right because uh, the Chanson de Geste deals with conflicts between families and nations rather than with the individual destinies of knights who um, mature personally as much as off the battlefield or tournament ground uh, as on it right the first old French romances which date from the third quarter again of, of the 12th century are mm, mostly romances of antiquity that represent the third of Jean Baudel three categories uh, so mostly classical works this is fascinating there, there is a great philological revival in 12th century Europe right you have people from in fact especially France Italy that literally go to Spain uh, having learned already um, Greek and Arab sometimes Hebrew on their own um, to knowing that there was that matter to gr take them translate them and in bringing it back right the same goes for during the Crusades and this tells you how much the West was already as advanced as of course all the you know and, and actively went picking what they already knew they would find um, or at least they, 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 they knew where to search for um, abroad and not a passive reception of uh, the Atlantic Arabic works um, uh, that as if you know it, we needed them to, to be civilized it didn't work like that at all also because by the 12th century again uh, European civilization but not just by the same fa evidence that they were literally already knowing everything um, and wanted just to categorize further to perfect the philological knowledge etc but by any other indicator politically military and socially had reached and de facto surpassed the Byzantines uh, the Arabs we've seen it with the Frankish tactics during the Crusades the you know the Italian uh, fleets um, during the same and or you know the ones in which the Byzantines relied I mean we're talking about a massively um, impacting civilizational power properly of, of the Frankish world broadly meant um, and in fact um, you find among this um, top chanson the, uh, the anonymous Roman de Thèbes this dating to the mid 12th century, uh, which actually expands uh, Statius uh, Tebide on the basis of all its metamorphoses. In telling uh, of the seven against the, uh, Tebes or Thebes, if you prefer. Um, so, even being able again to mold the stories that the way they, they wished to, to perfect, and knowing, of course, the originals, um, then there is the anonymous Roman de Nes, uh, uh, dated to around 1155, based on Virgil's Aeneid. The Roman de Troyes by Benoit de saint maur dating to 1165-70, on the base of the late classical text by Deers and Dictus. Then we find um, some uh, episodes adapted um, from Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, we find uh, Philomena by Chrétien de Troyes, Pyramus at Tisbe, dating to 1165-17, and Narcissus from 1165. Uh, for not talking about the Alexandrian epos, 
right? This was extremely powerful. Um, the contemporary Islamic literature was absolutely crazy for Alexander. And, uh, you know, the Muslims had their own type of chivalric uh, literature in parallel. So um, most of all these peoples were doing the same things. But Alexander was actually a much more impacting uh, hero. Culture and civilization in medieval Islam, that even it was uh, medieval Christianity. And Alexander actually was, however, the most uh, famous, and correctly so, um, commander, in fact, most favorite um, story character for, for essentially the military uh, literature in medieval Europe, right? Even before the Romans, or uh, in fact the St. Carolingians, as we've seen. So this is pretty interesting. Because um, it also m is correct from a traditional standpoint, as what essentially the same Romans, starting from Caesar, that cried over Alexander's statue that was already too old compared to what Alexander had achieved. So by dying so young, as the greatest commander in the history of mankind, hands down. Right? I will not explain why in this video, but uh, it's as if the medievals knew much more correctly what was the deal historically in terms of that military assessment and broader symbol that uh, Alexander had been, that we have instead turned just into a you know, movie figure rather than anything, and that is then the, the colossal power of, of, of divine transfiguration. Um, uh, it, then us, right? Um, and um, I will not digress naturally on uh, other considerations regarding the accuracy of this statement because we will do it. We never really talked about Alexander now that I think about that. He has minor things like his panoply, etc. But, you know, it, it's such a huge topic that I don't even know how to approach it because uh, I could talk endlessly about him. But the, the question is, how do you even frame him beyond, of course, this magnitude, the Megas himself, his megalopsyche, etc. Well, the 12th century writers were pretty much aware, however, of his centrality uh, in this regard. Um, all the aforementioned narratives are mostly in octosyllabic couplets, mm -hmm. and they literally boomed, literally speaking, right, within the uh, macrocosm of uh, heroic epos, they blended marvelously and they, uh, this shows again yet yeah, that Alexander was absolutely fitting the, uh, the traditional background, not just per se, but for all the other that had been saved more selectively within this environment, even just on original scale as we've seen now. Um, added to it, there is, however, some more sentimental uh, and erotic content that these authors draw mostly from Ovid's uh, emotional uh, uh, work, fundamentally, that, you know, was uh, actually still part of a traditional awareness of the power of the senses that had to be countered and that um, we are struggling against by, by a certain degree. And that was also a particularly dear topic to, again, traditional knighthood. Uh, in 12th century topic, we see um, Latin works that are essentially being studied, rendered, uh, read and reworked together with French ones. This is the point. There is uh, a parallelism between the Latin and the Romance, in this case, uh, literature. Um, for example, uh, Simon Chardot, so the Golden Goat, the Aurea Capra, in Latin, dating to the mid 12th century, and uh, Joseph of Exeter, who died around 1210, who uh, are two authors. Latin poets who recast 
quite uh, exceptionally because they were essentially um, just a, a few m authors doing this. The, the Trojan Legion in Examiners plus Walter Chatillon who was born around 1135 and died 1179 who even came to um, reshape the ancient legions on Alexander in his exometric epos, the Alexandres. Mm -hmm. The point uh, and problem for, for these authors, however, was that there were other poets at the time, etc., that um, knew how different this romance um, was from the the original, right? Most of these works naturally were um, modeled from the Latin sources, right? So also Latin translations of Greek works. Only at this point you start finding, of course, a capacity to translate, or but it's rare from Greek. So there was a, a big literary problem to that uh, these authors were facing because um, the two languages are different in, in so many ways. I mean, if you want to write especially something in metric, you have to be aware that, you know, in Latin, I mean, you don't even have articles, right? So it, the entire grammar and syntax work differently and from an artistic point of view, a literary point of view, that changes per se just even probably the same content. Um, not just in an expressional way but what brings you of course to, to do uh, just per se. And um, this is how properly the, co the concept of, of, the, of the romance comes about, literally speaking. Becoming a literary term designating, yes, a, a different language, but properly a set of works too, right? And so of style and particular genre, distinguished from the term romance that was previously used just to, de uh, to designate vulgar Latin or proto-romance language. Actually, we, we, we shall make some linguistic history, in this case of Old French, uh, in literature, because the way vernacular came about also as a literary language is a huge deal in European history. Right? In places like France and Germany, vernacular appeared earlier, since basically the 9th century is a literary language. In places like Italy, it took like the 12th, the 13th, um, and this is not just a matter of proximity with, with Latin, uh, but also with different levels of literacy and of education. And this influenced massively the entire European literature, because they were all intertwined. And in fact, most of what you see, and still to this very day, is a product of this balance, of this hierarchy, of the, this, uh, the interaction between these differences by the way. Um, and it's obvious that the old French romances of the 12th century essentially medievalize thoroughly the classical works. Right, because they literally began to rewrite things like the Aeneid, uh, many other sagas the medieval way, right? Literally changing the the contents about it. For example, in the Roman de Nias, right? The fights around Troy uh, resemble chivalric encounters. The uh, in fact, the ancient chiefs. Of course, Virgil was writing later. It was all the legion that had developed about Aeneas. That is different, as you know from the Iliad or, or the Odyssey, but they, it did revolve around, the, the, say, it was part of the Trojan cycle as a whole, 
But the character, instead of being Bronze Age chieftains, they're fundamentally princes, barons, dukes, just like in 12th century France. These soldiers just per se are knights errant, right? Inspiring to win love of their lady loves, just like in courtly poetry. And there are other interestingly, you know, stereotype figures. For example, Prince Pallas is dubbed a knight by his father and, and girded with a sword by an ass. Uh, you can find it in the Roman de Nes in the lines 48. 11, 12, um, which naturally is is eloquent regarding the very dubbing um, ceremony that took place in, in the 12th century was becoming ever more qualifying, uh, and um, you know also of course uh, transposing a hierarchy uh, in the in the work, uh, in the in the setting that had to be confronted with the one of the original innate by Verge. Uh, so there had to be an important knowledge of the same work in order to do this. Uh, there was a religious atmosphere too, which you don't find uh, at least in the same way, like in a classical work, like the one of Virgil, like compared to a 12th century uh, Frankish one. For example, the prophet Calchas is rendered in two medieval terms as a bishop, in the lines 1003 to, to 10, um, and don't think that it wasn't properly understood or perceived like that, even in, in the Middle Ages. How would these people think the past? Right. Um, if there was a prophet, uh, a priest, whatever, it's obvious that you would essentially represent him in, at that point, a Christian uh, best, uh, knowing that that priestly office was, however, part of a previous set of values that had not, at the end of the day, changed so radically as we think they did. We need to put a barrier between the ancient world and the Middle Ages. Just, just um, a modern fiction. Nor the two eras ever existed per se, but even the differences are actually much more secondary than what we think the role of a, for example, a priestly figure had to be for, especially in the classical world compared to in fact, a, a 12th century one, right? Uh, it, it's just um, a specific frame set that you may connect to also the, um, the necessity of rendering this content more edifying. Right? People knew that the ancient religion was somehow different, but in order to present the story, to make it even more enjoyable, more, um, uh, more relatable, you would change this. But just to make an example, Dante, just a century later, describes Muhammad just like a schismatic bishop. Because of course there cannot be anything but the universal uh, Christian tradition, out of which th th there's probably not even a place for something different from it. It's just an error, a mistake. Um, and Dante was an extremely cultured person. So there is a deliberate choice that blends narrative um, needs, even contingent ones, uh, actual you know, belief that things were frameable in that uh, way, but for the sake of a practical purpose still and a worldview that was much more unitary in the Middle Ages, and in this overlapping dramatically with the classical past than we think today. Uh, also, women are important. Dido and Lavinia, for example, uh, is um, you know are very important characters in, in here representing the you know the the, the antipodes. Uh, 
that but there is a deep knowledge uh, deep, uh, model even there for courtly uh, morals right and what women had to be about and not it's just you know is Ill illicitly passion and just mere sexual objects but also models of virtue in order two things combine and in the case of the Carthaginian queen but something that the hero had to seize uh, in a conquering way regardless of the uh, of sentimentalism because that was the Iranian Apollonian idea and so even women that exactly in these centuries were being discussed even in ecclesiastical councils whether you know what about the saints right the, the female saints like do we have to how to explain the problem of the soul that in the in the European tradition was only about men practically um, and in the at least in the possibility of transcendence and women were fundamentally attached to men in, in the process uh, through you know the sacred marriage right so it's how just think of how complicated this can be so there was a deep um, awareness even in the 12th century of the actual meaning beyond uh, and difference be beyond the say the, the seduced prey of war and actually th the matter of the of the future heroes right um, the good ones because this is something that you find even in the, I don't know, in the Nibelungen lead with uh, Kremild and Brunhild, and even though things end bad, much worse, generally speaking, as we were saying before, in the Germanic um, tradition, and there is always something that doesn't work, the, the Greeks and the Romans had outlined dichotomically things in a, a more, you know, um, archetypal, uh, say, neatly distinguished archetypal way, but this is just for saying how relatable these meanings could still be by the 12th century and that we generally speaking don't don't look at in, in this light there was also a, a philological historical problem because other authors uh, that were uh, admittedly as we were saying before there were just a few ones who altered the older sources to create essentially a different um, uh, say even a different story like properly in including other or modifying like in this case other some aspects o compared uh, to the, the originals that triggered um, in fact others um, uh, both linguistically and just historically let's say because mm -hmm. of course in the 12th century you start having universities you start having very advanced centers of learning where properly latin is well mastered together with matrix together with properly a uh, top understanding of the highest classical culture so um, the latin Tin adapters provoked a hostile reaction in some quarters. For example, Alan of Lille, born around 1125 and died in 1203, um, began to criticize, uh, to, to criticize uh, specifically uh, Joseph of Exeter and Walter of Chatillon regarding their uh, respective Trojan cycles works um, and Alexander the Great one uh, and he writes and like this in Latin illic pannoso plebescit carmine noster ennius et priemi fortunas intonant illic mevius in celos audens os ponere mutum Gesta ducis macedum tenebrosi carminis umbra pingere dum temptat, which meant essentially here we have uh, our own Ennius patched work in, in a in a poem um, written for the mob and 
um, thundering fort in the uh, with fortunes fortunes of Priam, and here we have Mavius daring to raise a dumb mouth to heaven, trying to portray the exploit of the Macedonians um, in a in a dark and shadowy ode. And uh, of, of course, referring to the aforementioned authors who had practically, uh, you know, diminished, of course, the the heights of classical work uh, linguistically, literally, from you know, uh, naturally a, a, a classicist standpoint. This is interesting because it naturally tells you how, of course, revered um, the matters of Rome really were, especially by authors of a, also of a certain importance that could be composing chansons th themselves. Um, of course, the adaptations of works like Joseph of Exeter and Wart of Chantillon must be understood within the context of their time. Uh, they were modifying the ancient stories, sometimes cleverly, for evident political aims, right? Uh, especially the ones of the Norman rulers. This is perhaps an overlooked factor. I mean, the um, uh, the the problem of uh, the Normans in many ways, just to think about William the Bastard, right? You know, um, but also as creators of of a new kingdom, because after all, even if though the, the English one already existed, they really the Normans really established an, a new regime of some sort, um, and the Normans were just descendants from the the Viking settlers on the in the lower Seine. And they had had always, as you know, a conflictual relation with the Western Frankish kings, even though being their vassals. So the reason why the Trojan cycles were resumed so importantly was even to literally fabricate um, a uh, a genealogy, right? Just like it happened in Rome, it, 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 it's the same thing that Virgil did, right? The the Aeneid per se. Uh, was part of a set of legions already at the time that Virgil re-edited to make obviously the, the history of um, of Rome connected with the one of, of Troy because all the greatest heroes ever given that the Iliad and the Odyssey were just the the thing not say that permeated the entire classical civilization at that point just in terms of models of values whatever everybody was exalted with Achilles uh, just to make an example, um, from the greatest commanders to the most uh, average hoplite, right? They were all in love fanatically and legitimately with properly the uh, like a psychopathic serial killer like Achilles that embodied the perfect Indo-European hero that, in fact, doesn't have to be affected by any sentiment in order to be able to dominate the world. And even in there, there is a bit like the the doom always of course appearing that says watch out you can be the greatest warrior can be invincible but you always have your in fact Achilles heel um, it's like Siegfried right uh, it's the same concept um, and the uh, the Normans that of course had great uh, ambitions and at this point were also um, through their connections at least between France Italy ruling on Sicily and you know being aware of this massive classical legacy that reigned uh, I mean in the 12th century the Sicilian school of poetry was literally booming right as one of the single most refined literatures in Europe uh, to say the least um, and they needed in a sense to fabricate this, this this old idea that they had come from Troy themselves I'm not uh, kidding right so that you have literally a translatio studi right that is learning from Greece to Rome to France inextricably connected with the Translatio Imperi so the military power but divinely meant right when we talk about the Angevin Empire of course it wasn't termed like that but everybody knew what that practically meant it's just like again the, the ambiguity that we discuss so often of the Holy Roman Empire why did the Holy Roman Empire was we have conceptualized it, at least, with limited to Germany, 
Italy, Bohemia, and Burgundy, but, you know, wasn't France, like, part of it. It's the universal Catholic empire. England does, too. Uh, Poland does, too. And Castile does, too. Etc. Um, and ideally anything else, because, you know, it's what, what is not part of it, it was not under the control of it. It, it must be uh, just as a broader aim. So it was particularly important to uh, reattach the culture of the great courts of Europe, such as the one of uh, what was de facto becoming London and Paris, chiefly, um, to these higher uh, cultures blending in the great, all the great traditions, the classical one, the uh, in fact, the, the, the Carolingian one, but also the Celtic one, the Germanic one, the Christian one, because, of course, the histories of the Bible, right, and of God, the Lord of battle, were, were there since ever. Like, already in Carolingian times, as you know, Charlemagne himself was brutally obsessed with David, that he thought essentially to, to be, as just the, the Franks, like the chosen people. There is much more that the Carolingian... I, imperial ideology owes to the Old Testament than to the to the new one because it was much more directly intelligible in terms of the rule of this war that was the only single thing that any Frank ever knew by definition and nothing else nothing possibly else um, because again the entire universal tradition had gravitated only and unavoidably only on this it was about power Right, and a power that in the 12th century was booming, as we've seen, in all these great uh, political and territorial constructions that uh, were achieving results that had never been seen fundamentally since. In fact, the Saint Charlemagne. Um, so all comes in. You need all the the, the legacies of the of the Roman Empire, of of, of the Bible, of Charlemagne, because without that you, we can't not go anywhere. And depending on who you are, you're going to stress different sides of the story, including, again, maybe the, these authors, as we've seen, like an even more Victorian cycle than a Carolingian one as knights, uh, and or like um, getting fascinated with all the characters of the Iliad, because they are all different warriors, they do different things, they have different specialties, and they uh, left room, in fact, for, for the various vassals who could be at a court to identify with the various ones. And you can't see these um, literary uh, machinations, of course, not just in the chanson de geste, but also in basic literature. I mean, even the church w was reading this stuff. If you read the chronicle of this time, you of course, Latin was sounding ever more like Levi's or Virgil's one, as far as the, the military, for example, and explode these, uh, this establishment, which essentially, again, were all knights, were about. You can easily track that. Uh, of course, uh, historiography is becoming ever more interesting in many ways. Um, this thing, especially of tracking a genealogical uh, origin of the in fact the, uh, to legitimate better the dynasties and even ethnic groups uh, it, it's not just a French thing for example the Icelander Snorri Sturluson so the greatest sagas writer ever as far as the Norse at least are concerned goes as far as saying <laughs> that the Scandinavian gods originated in Troy Right, which you would think uh, mythologically is horrifying, but it, it's also fascinating because they were after tradition in their own way. Right, uh, just yesterday we were making a video about medieval Norway, so Snorri Sturluson is uh, very fitting, uh, and uh, we have seen how you know you, how could you imagine a thirteenth, twelfth, thirteenth century, uh, you know. The, the the Sturlung's background culturally or how much they were connected with
with Europe. They actually were a lot, and this elite that again was relatively modest, uh, after all, not definitely not hierarchically stratified like the, the feudal ones of France or, or England, but still was going as far as saying, "Look, our um, Norse uh, deities basically originated literally in Troy themselves." Doesn't make any sense. But it was a way of saying, we want to stick to tradition, we want to be part of the great hierarchy of world powers, right? even in our, in our essence. And I think this makes European history much more deeply felt than today, because today in popular culture we think, ah, you know, Iceland, like a thing that is severed from any other thing because it's the pure north and nothing else. We have literally Snorri Sturluson, the single most important um, cultural figure in Icelandic history that goes as far as saying that the entire Norse universe basically revolved around, in his view, of course, that uh, is, remains his view, but around the Trojan legion of the ancient Atlantic and Roman world. And th this is powerful, as, as I thought. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and this thing is, again, very spread outside the French-speaking world that we mostly refer to today. I mean, isn't it what the same Romans had done in the past? Right? Uh, yes, there were colonists from the East uh, in the Mediterranean. There could be easily a connection between, the, I don't know, the, uh, the, the, the Great Bronze Age, like the Indo-European populations, Achilles, like across the, the Aegean, Asia Minor, Anatolia, and, and Europe, that could have had uh, could have been the ancestry of, uh, you know, Italian populations, but uh, weren't the Romans just saying, you know, we we are drawing from that source as well because that's the great epos, the greatest epos of all, and we want to be part of it. Just think about how this, how far this epos dominated in everything, in politics, in culture, in mentality. This is not just. Um, you know, intellectualistic game. They literally felt the need to internationally present themselves like this, because they attributed so much uh, greatness to those legions that were actual what they actually what they felt they were, and of course, making these men. This is the important thing: descending from gods, because that's literally what eventually the Trojan uh, uh, cycle is about, right? So a moment in which it was surely as a work stratified, uh, etc. But, you know, a moment in which people literally believed that a Bronze Age warlord coming from the sea, raping, murdering, uh, lording, was, was a demigod. So just think about the hierarchy involved here and what it meant to draw such genealogical connections. Um, and people were crazy about this stuff at the time. For example, Herbert von Fritzler um, imitated uh, Benoit, uh, before mentioned Benoit, in his Trojaner Krieg. Right? The Germans were quite interested in themselves, interested in themselves in this. Um, uh, there is this example also about Heinrich von Feldecke, who wrote an innate in Middle High German, so this is the same language of the Minnesänga. Well, Feldecke's work was mm, presented, by the way, in an unfinished translation of the from the Old French, Roman de Neas, to the Countess Margaret of Cleve on occasion of her marriage to the Landgrave Ludwig III of Thuringia in 1175. I made a video about medieval Thuringia last month if you're interested. These are very fascinating characters. Um, so this was, for example, probably a, a land gravial marriage gift, right? A translation from the uh, essentially of, of the innate from Latin to Old French to Middle High German. So with or a readaptation in part, uh, of course. <coughs> 
and the mere manuscript that admittedly cost a lot because manuscripts still by the 12th century were really right in terms of material cost enormous right how, how many ships were butchered <laughs> just for, for for making a, a manuscript and which manuscripts with which uh, refinement with which uh, in, uh, in, you know uh, overall aesthetics right not just the illuminations but properly the, the entire design and and writing etc um, so precious that it was stolen practically <laughs> from Margaret of Cleve by her brother-in-law the Count Henry and um, the same uh, Heinrich von Feldecker could not retrieve the manuscript from Henry um, for almost 10 years right in fact it would be completed as a consequence only after 1184 and before 1190 so they were making it circulate even though it was not finished even in translation because it was so precious and people wanted to read and know it and these were the top feudal families in Germany uh, that they had to simply have it before it was finished that it would be stolen not given back and it created a huge issue in the process um, so uh, you understand that for these counts and land graves, just like the Roman Danes was so important as the the entire expressional idealization of court love of chivalric knighthood that was codifying their own world, their own retinues, their own political legitimization, um, as much as their dynastic origins, because that's what basically they thought they were I mean the Roman Danias is talking literally about the origins of the Roman people in the 12th century the Germans called themselves Romans in the sources or even in the 13th you they said the Germans the German battle cry was here's Rome here home um, do you understand what this means I mean, how powerful it is for something that was called, you know, Holy Roman Empire. Uh, uh, people still live, again, in uh, 19th century nationalistic and socialistic delusions when our past is literally this, as Europeans, as Westerners. Right. Think about it. Next time you think about properly Europe, European identity, what the European Union must be, what I think is the colonial and imperial destiny of Europe. Anyway, whatever it happens, um, it's not also a coincidence that in order to support his uh, crusading and imperial ambitions, a chanson de Roland would be commissioned by, nonetheless, the Duke of Saxony, Henry the Lion, and his wife, with uh, to the author Father Conrad. Mm. And here we're talking about literally Henry being um, a Belfan and Este dynast, uh, the cousin of the same Holy Roman Emperor, right, uh, who was striving for you know, power in Germany, essentially quasi-royal status. Just think about what the Regnum meant. Historically, also in relation to the imperial power, a bit like what we were saying before, the knights also being in conflict with the kings, after all, preferring maybe the Arthurian cycle as opposed to... This case is the Chanson de Roland, I can find like a conflictual point, it was just an, a classic at that point anyway but it was like saying we are the true heroes of the situation as well right? as dukes of Saxony as vassals of the king of Germany Holy Roman Emperor 
Um, so I think it's always interesting. Sometimes I get lost into some kind of ramble, but um, um, never underestimate literature. Never underestimate the fact that you can't always find everything in the sources. This is something we have started to forget. Importantly, that people want to know the version, the take. Right. I guess many of you also come here just to say to, to hear what I say because that's how fundamentally I structured my content. But the point is that you have the entire history, you have the entire literature, you have the entire sources, the entire evidence. Just reading one of the sources can tell you much. If I can help you just by giving you this advice, is uh, you know I'm I'm glad of it. Of course, I, I believe we will keep doing it because literally. I can literally tell you, I swear, uh, my word, that we haven't even began. Like this stuff, like I see the 1600 videos as nothing, right? Uh, I will not, I will never leave enough to finish this thing, uh, but not even arriving close to it, to doing it, right? So um, let's understand that it's a work that must take a much greater scale and that involves our cooperation, our unity, right? And if we get each other on what we're talking about, which I think we do, because I do see that you follow, we can go very far. Uh, as far as changing the world, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure that we will. Um, for today, however, think one thing at a time. I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.